how you have been? It's so nice to see you again. Well, I had my uh, forensic science exam yesterday. Oh, really? <laughs> so I, I've been marking exam papers all day. <laughs> I also have lined up like 170 copies with me for forensic biology. I oh, also have to correct. Oh, I have 750. Oh my God, yeah. <laughs> I'm still in good shape. <laughs> But, but we did the exam online. Uh, same for us, sir. We yeah. also did the... So, so when are you planning to visit Bhopal again? You said you came to Aisar Bhopal last time when we were talking. Um, well, who knows? Uh, <laughs> I mean, they have just announced that there will be a travel lane between Singapore and India without quarantine. Oh, okay, sir. Mm -hmm. But now they're waiting for uh, the flights to be authorized because there are no commercial flights. There are only special government flights at the moment. Okay, okay. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, we're wait, waiting to see what happens. Yes, we'll be happy to host you, sir, whenever you want to visit India. Uh, hopefully it will be possible next year. Yes, sir. So are all of your students vaccinated? Uh, sir, whoever has reported to the campus, they all are vaccinated. Excellent, excellent. Uh, because like I told you last time also, I'm from bioengineering, so they require this lab and stuff. So they are being called back. So this was already mentioned uh, in the email that they have to be vaccinated before they report to the yeah. campus. Yeah, I think. What is, I think here now, well over 90% of people on campus are vaccinated. All right, sir. All and right. Uh, anyone who is not vaccinated must do an ART test before they come to campus. Okay. <laughs> so things are getting stricter. Things yeah. are getting stricter. So what, if, what about the status of COVID in Singapore? Well, yeah, we, we are in a transition. Okay, sir. Because we, we were keeping COVID down to as close to zero as possible. Mm -hmm. But now we're transitioning to COVID being endemic. Yeah, yeah it's, not going to, uh, yeah, it's not going to go, it's just be, it'll be there. Yeah. Probably we'll have to have the shot every, every year. I think the those maybe, maybe, maybe more. I maybe mean, more. I just I just had my third shot. You already had your third, which I was think... six months after the second shot. Okay. So I, I don't know. We we may be. Uh, what I have uh, planned, like in India, they are giving the third shot only to the doctors who are dealing with the patients at present. At present. Maybe, yes, sir. Maybe yeah. later. All that's, the... that's because of supply. Yeah, you can say, it, but now India is making its own vaccine, so I don't know. Yeah. They're ex they, they are exporting. Yeah, so. I mean, what they did here was first of all announce third shot for elderly. Yeah. And then they're slowly moving down the age group. Yes, yeah, so the same thing here. They started with the elderly, then 40 and uh, below, and now to children, of course because they have to go back to school. They actually already started going back to school, so they're looking forward. I think we're doing a trial for children. Okay. I mean, that's the five to 11 age group. Right, same, same yeah. age group. Just uh, running the trial to make sure it's safe. But I'm sure it will be, and then we'll be, we'll be vaccinating everyone from five years and up. Yeah, that is the goal now. Mm. Because they're going back to school and uh, without vaccination, it's still at risk, so. That's very risky, yes. yes. But the big thing for us is whether we can open the border with Malaysia. <laughs> right. Which in normal time is in a, it's a very busy border crossing. Right, right. right so that's, the, the, they're looking to open that border to some extent. Right, sir. That will be a big thing.
So I think, sir, I think the students are joining. So I think we can start. So I'll just give the brief intro to Professor Roderick Bates. And it's a pleasure of us that he is uh, back with us. And he's a very humble person, I must say. I just uh, had taken his course on Coursera and he agreed to, you know, give this talk despite of his uh, busy schedule. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you are. <laughs> so you are. It's nice to give this talk because I need a break <laughs> from marking. <laughs> yes, sir. So Professor Bates is actually currently an associate professor and a fellow uh, of NTU Teaching Excellence Academy. He also serves as the university's research integrity uh, of officer. His, his uh, research interests are in the use of transition metals in organic synthesis. And uh, his book, uh, Organic Synthesis Using Transition Metals, it was published in 2012. And he's also a lecturer on forensic science for a Coursera MOOC. So without further ado, I would request uh, Professor Bates to take over from here. A very warm welcome, sir. Thank you. I'm happy to be back. So let me share my screen. I think it's that one. There's some security thing, but so do you need from our side? No, it's something on this computer. Oh, okay, okay. So it is. I don't know what it needs. Let me just try it again. I don't know what it needs. Sir, are you able to share the screen, sir? Okay, can you see that now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I don't know what I did, but it seems to work. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, sir, we have a uh, Dr. Siddharth Methi also with us. He's also assistant professor in the Department of Bioengineering. Oh, welcome. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, it, it was a pleasure to meet you, sir. Okay. All right, let me let me get started. So somebody needs to mute. Okay. So I was asked to talk about forensic biology, and forensic biology means DNA. And the term that I chose was revolution, because the introduction of DNA technology into forensic science really did create a revolution in the way that things were done. So in order to understand just the magnitude of this revolution, what I want you to what I want to do 
is to take you back to the years before 1986. So before 1986, okay, this is where we were. Suppose you have a crime scene where there is blood. What information can you get from blood? Well, obviously you can get blood type. And what I've shown on the screen is the distribution of the four main blood types uh, in India, okay? And you can see that the least common blood type is AB at about 8% of the Indian population. Now you probably know there are additional methods for typing, including rhesus, positive and negative. And in India, almost everybody is rhesus positive. There's only 5% who are rhesus negative, which means that the least common blood type is AB negative. Now in India, the number of people with AB negative, you can calculate 55 lakh of people. So if you have a crime scene and there's blood at the crime scene, and that blood type is AB negative, you have five and a half million possible suspects in your country. And so this is the problem with blood. Before 1986, you cannot individualize blood. You can narrow it down to a group, but you can't narrow it down to one person. And so with the, the least common blood group, 55 lakh of suspects. So let's see how that works out. So I'm gonna take you back even further in time to 1939. And this is a town on the south coast of England called Bournemouth. And this elderly man called Walter Dinovan was found in his home. His skull had been crushed, he did bashed on the head and he died in hospital without recovering consciousness, which means the only witness to the murder is the victim and he's dead. The motive was robbery. The man's valuables had been taken. And the police also found a crumpled brown paper bag at the crime scene, which they believe the murderer had used to hold the weapon which means no fingerprints. But they did find cigarette butts on the floor of the room. And it's from the cigarette butts that they tried to identify the killer. Because when you smoke a cigarette, you'll leave saliva on the butt of the cigarette. And for most people, you can tell blood group from their saliva. Now, inquiries by the police had led them to suspect this local man called Joseph Williams. And the saliva on the cigarette butt was type AB, which in England is only 3% of the population. So it's uncommon. So the big question they had was what was Joseph Williams' blood group? Was it AB? So how do you find someone's blood group if they are a suspect in a criminal case? Well, what the officer leading the investigation did was to take Joseph Williams to the pub and buy him lots of drinks. And then when Williams had drunk too much, and staggered home, the police officer gathered up all the glasses like this one, and then they could get saliva from the rim of the glasses and test it. And they showed Williams was type AB, matching the cigarette parts of the crime scene. Okay. But when it went to trial, the lawyer defending Joseph Williams managed to demolish the forensic evidence. He convinced the jury that this forensic evidence was not reliable and Joseph Williams was found 
not guilty. But we know that Williams was guilty because he went drinking and he told a journalist that he did the murder. But because of the laws of libel, the journalist could not publish the story until after Williams was dead. So Williams got away with murder because the police could not prove his identity from the saliva. Okay, that was back in 1939. And you can see the limits of forensic technology of that era. Now, let's move forward. Let's jump forward to 1983. And we're going to jump to a small village in England called Narborough. And the body of a young woman, just 15 years old, called Linda Mann, was found in the woods outside Narborough. And she had been raped and murdered. And based on the technology available in 1983, the only forensic information that could be obtained was that whoever killed her was blood type A. And A is very common, unsolved. Three years later, Dawn Ashworth, also 15, also raped and murdered and left in the same location. And this time, a young man who lived in Narbra confessed to Dawn's murder. This guy called Richard Buckland came forward and confessed to Dawn's murder, but he would not confess to the murder of Linda. He said he only did one of them, but the police were convinced the same man did both murders because they were so similar in the way they were done. So what can you do? Do you take Richard Buckland to court for one murder and let the other go? No, what the police did was consult a professor at the University of Leicester. And Leicester is quite close to Narborough by, by chance. And that professor was a man called Alec Jeffries. And Jeffries had developed DNA profiling, what is often referred to as DNA fingerprinting. We'll talk about it a bit later, but he developed a way to show that DNA could be individualized to a single person. So the police asked Alec Jeffries to analyze the samples from the two crimes and compare them to a blood sample taken from Richard Buckland. And then Jeffries does the analysis and he comes back to the police and he has good news and he has bad news. The good news is that they were right. Both girls were killed by the same man. But that man was not Richard Buckland. Buckland actually confessed to a crime he did not commit. Now, you have the DNA. How can you catch the killer? Because your name is not written into your DNA. So what they did was get every man in Narbara who was blood type A to give a sample for Alec Jeffries to test the DNA compared to the DNA from the crime scene. And they tested more than 1,000 samples and they couldn't find a match. So it looked like the murderer was not a local man. The murderer came from somewhere outside Narbra. So you'll never catch him. But you see, solving a crime takes investigation, it takes science, and sometimes it takes luck. And the, whoops, and the police got lucky because a woman in a pub overheard the conversation at the next table. And the man at the next table called Ian Kelly 
was boasting that he earned 50 pounds by giving a blood sample under his friend's name. So Ian Kelly had given the name Colin Pitchfork when giving his blood sample. The woman realized the implications, went to the police. The police then went and arrested Colin Pitchfork and made him give a genuine blood sample. And when that blood sample was analyzed by Alec Jeffries, of course, it was a match to the murderer. So when Pitchfork was told that his DNA matched, he confessed to the two murders and he was sentenced to life in prison. And he was sentenced to serve a minimum of 30 years in prison. Now, Colin Pitchfork was back in the news just la earlier this week because now it's 2021 and Colin Pitchfork had been released from prison on parole. But just this week, he was taken back into prison because when you're released on parole, there are conditions you have to follow. And he had broken those conditions. And that's why they hauled him back to prison. So at this moment, as I speak to you, Colin Pitchfork is in prison. And as you can see, he is a very important figure in forensic science because Colin Pitchfork is the first person convicted of crime based on DNA. So he's the first person convicted as part of this DNA revolution. So his is a name that has to be remembered. So let's talk a little bit about how DNA works. So your body has about 60 trillion cells. Now, except for your red blood cells, every cell contains a nucleus and in the nucleus, there's a copy of your DNA. Okay, in the nucleus of every cell except the red blood cells. Now, what you have to remember in terms of forensic science is that you never find DNA at a crime scene. You find cells at the crime scene that contain DNA. So you might find blood or semen or saliva or skin cells or hair or body parts. So at the crime scene, you're looking for biological material from which you can then extract DNA. And of course, uh, the biological material provides the context for that DNA. So you probably all know this. DNA is a polymer and it's made up of the four nucleotides, A, G, C, and T. Each nucleotide consists of a sugar, which is the deoxyribose shown in black, and one of the four bases, which are shown in blue. And the phosphates simply link the sugars together to make the chain that is DNA. And those phosphates also make sure that the DNA is negatively charged. So that the negative charge on the DNA molecule is something you'll see the importance of that in a few slides time. Okay. Now, you, I'm sure you've all heard that DNA is a double helix. And that means you have two strands of DNA wound together and they are connected by base pairing. And you have this wonderful complementary base pairing where A and T bind together through hydrogen bonding and G and C bind together through hydrogen bonding. So that is how you build up uh, the, the DNA molecule and you get this recognition between the two strands. Now, for an organic chemist, when we analyze a molecule, we analyze the whole molecule. But the DNA molecule is too big. You cannot analyze an entire DNA molecule. So for analysis, what you do is to cut the DNA molecule into small pieces. And this is done using what are called restriction enzymes, which will cut the DNA at specific places. 
So you chop it up into little bits and it's that collection of bits that you analyze. Now, what Alec Jeffries realized is which fragments of DNA you're gonna look for. Because DNA, there's two types within the DNA molecule. There's what is called the coding regions and there's the non-coding regions. Now the coding regions of the DNA, which is about 10% or so of DNA, the coding regions is actually the instructions for creating us. The information to create a human being is in the coding regions. And that means that the coding regions are virtually identical in every single human being. There are minor, minor differences. Like my hair is a different color to your hair. But that's tiny compared to the vast mass of information. We are basically all the same. And we're all the same, you know, there's a lot of similarity also with other species. So within the coding region, you do not get variability. But Alec Jeffries found that in the non-coding region, which is also called junk DNA, you get variability. And there are parts of the so-called junk DNA, which are unique to particular individuals. And that was his great contribution, because if you identify those stretches of DNA that are unique to the individual, you can use it to identify individuals. That is why he was able to solve the Colin Pitchfork murder case. I always thought Alec Jeffries should win a Nobel Prize, but it never happened. Okay, so this is the technology. Once you have all those fragments, this is how you separate these fragments. So this is a video. Okay, so this is a gel. All right. And then we put samples in these wells at one side of the gel. And these would be your samples as well as your standards. And then we apply an electric voltage across the gel. And remember that the DNA fragments have a negative charge because of the phosphate. So they migrate towards the positive end. And the, they migrate at different rates. And so you get the different fragments all separating out. And so that is the original technique that was used by Alec Jeffries to separate out all these fragments and to do the analysis. So this technique is still very widely used in biology, but for DNA, a different technique is typically used. Okay, and the technique that is used normally is called capillary electrophoresis. So if you see that gray line running horizontally, that is a capillary which contains the gel. Okay, so we have the cathode and the anode, and our detector is based on a UV lamp. Right. The sample will appear in a minute. Here comes the sample. We put the sample in at the negative end. We apply the voltage. The fragments move towards the positive, but at different rates. They are detected by the UV lamp, and we get a signal on the computer. Okay, and you can see here we detected three DNA fragments. So this is capillary gel electrophoresis. And if you take a DNA sample and you use this technique, then you can get the result. Now, when you chop up the DNA and you get lots of fragments, which fragments do you look for in order to individualize the sample. And what is used currently is called an STR, or short tandem repeat. So a short tandem repeat is a little sequence of base pairs which repeats itself, okay, multiple times. 
So the example I give you here is called TH01, and it goes AATG, AATG, AATG. It's repeated a number of times. So what is individual is not who has AATG, what is individual is the number of repeats, okay? And you will have two sets, one from mother, one from father. So for instance, if you have THO168, that means you've got THO1 repeated six times from one parent and repeated eight times from the other parent. And this one, THO168, is quite common. It's found in about 4% of people. I presume American people. Okay. So then you're gonna ask, if this is found in 4%, that's not much better than blood type. So the reason that this can be used to individualize is because it's, they use a technique called multiplexing. So you don't just look for one STR, you look for a whole number of different STRs. So the Americans use 13, the British use 10. And the more STRs you look for, the greater the individualization you achieve. So if you use three STRs, you can identify to one in 5,000. If you use six STRs, you can identify to one in 2 million. If you use nine STRs, you're at one in a billion. And if you use 13 STRs like the US, you're into the hundreds of trillions. So the chance that two people have the same DNA profile when you use this number of STRs is vanishingly small. And this is why we can use DNA to identify one person out of the whole population of the world. Okay, so this is what it looks like. So if you use the capillary gel electrophoresis technique, you would get something like this, where A, B, C, D, E, et cetera, these are your pairs of STRs, always, well, not quite always, but pairs because mother and father contribute. And on the left, you can see the gender, which is from the XY chromosomes. Okay. And this pattern that you see here would be unique to a single individual. So let's see how it works. Okay, so let me go back a moment. So there's your mother, and I've shown just five STRs. And on the right is your father, and I've shown five STRs. So you will inherit one from each pair of your mother, like that. And one from each pair of your father, like that. And so what you have for your STRs is then a combination of the two, okay? Now, usually you get a pair because the number of repeats is different, but sometimes the number of repeats will be the same. And so instead of a pair, you will get a single spike, but it's a pair, it's just like it's THO66, the same number, okay? now. Because your STRs, your DNA is inherited, one application is in determining parentage, paternity and maternity. Okay, so here we have a child. Here we have the mother. And you can see that if you look at the pairs of STRs of the child, in each pair, one comes from the mother. And here's the father. And you can see that in each pair of STRs, the other one comes from the father. So if you see this, you can say this child really is the biological child of this couple. Now I've only shown it for 
five because I don't want the diagram to be so cluttered. But of course, you would do it on a much uh, 10 or 13, whatever. Okay, now let's take another example. Here's the child, there's the mother, and you can see that must be the genuine mother. Now, is this person the father? And you can see sometimes by chance there's a match. You can see that in the blue example, but if you look at purple and you look at pink and you look at green, you can see the STR doesn't match. So here we would say that this man is not the biological father of that child. And paternity and maternity testing is one of the big applications of DNA that usually it doesn't go reported in the same way that murder trials do. Now, brothers and sisters. So here we have a mother father and we have a child and the child sibling. Now, both children inherit randomly from the mother and the father, which means that the STRs of the child and the sibling don't look so similar. So in general, if you want to know if someone is the genuine brother or sister of another person, you do it by tracking back to the parents and showing they are both children of the same parents. Okay, so that's how uh, that kind of testing can be done. Now, let's just have a refresher. So DNA comes from your mother and your father randomly. And so brothers and sisters have different DNA. But there's one very important exception, and that is identical twins. So identical twins have identical DNA because they come from the same egg. And this creates a problem if someone who has an identical twin commits a crime. So if you have a crime scene, you have a DNA sample from the crime scene, how do you know which of the two twins committed the crime? And I have collection of stories from all around the world, but the one I'll share with you is from France. So this is from Marseille in France. So back in 2013, these two guys here, you can see their identical twins, Elwin and Johan, were arrested in a rape and sexual assault case. And they were arrested based on evidence from CCTV and witnesses. But as you can see, if you have CCTV, you have witnesses, you can't tell which one did the crime. I mean, you have no idea which one's which. And of course, there's DNA evidence, but because they're identical twins, their DNA is identical. But is it? The answer is no. The DNA of identical twins is not 100% identical. If you use the normal technique, which is the STR technique that I showed you, they will be identical. But if you sequence their entire genome, okay, every single base pair in the genome, you will find very small differences. And this is due to errors in uh, replication of the DNA. It's just copying errors. Now, the problem was for the police in Marseille back in 2013, the cost of sequencing a genome was about a million euros. And of course, you have to sequence three genomes, one for each twin and one for the crime scene. And this was more money than the Marseille police had available to them. Nowadays, it's cheaper. The prices have come down. So this case was actually not solved by DNA. Eventually, Elwin confessed that he did the crime. And he said that 
you know, he delayed confessing for so long because he thought his mother would be unhappy. But eventually he confessed and the crime was solved. But you can see that DNA has a limit. And that limit is when you come up against identical twins, unless you have the money to do the whole genome secretly. Okay, very important that I mention this technique, PCR, because I think with COVID going around, we've heard a lot about PCR, because of course PCR is used in uh, detection of COVID. Now what PCR is, it's a technique where you can duplicate the DNA. You decide which fragment of DNA or which fragments are interesting and you duplicate those. So you can easily copy it a million times. And this means you can get DNA from very, very small samples, duplicate it by PCR, so you have a much bigger sample, and then you can identify whose DNA it is because you've made the sample bigger. So example is saliva from cigarette ends, saliva from the back of a stamp, of very, very tiny blood stains. So PCR involves cycling. It does multiple cycles, and each time you do a cycle, you make a copy, and there's a PCR machine there. It's called a thermal cycler, and you can see it's just a fairly small benchtop machine. So we should have a video. Here we go, whoops. Just gonna play, okay. So this, is a little video showing how PCR is done. So here's your DNA, double-stranded. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna heat it up to 94 degrees. And at that temperature, it will break up into single-stranded DNA. And then we're gonna cool it down again. And we're going down to 60 degrees and we're gonna add these little DNA units, which are called primers. You can add any primer you want. It doesn't have to be the one shown there. Okay. So that binds to the DNA. Then we put in enzymes, which are going to build DNA. And we feed it the different nucleotides and the enzymes build the length of DNA, which is the exact complement of the fragment you were looking at. And then we repeat the cycle. We're going back up to 94 degrees and we break up again to single stranded. We cool it down again. We add our primers, warm it up a bit, add our enzymes, add our nucleotides. And you can see every time we run the cycle, we double the amount of DNA we have. And so if you have a very small amount of DNA, you do the PCR on it, and however many cycles you run, you duplicate it into a quantity that you can then analyze. So PCR has given us the ability to analyze very, very small samples of DNA, such as from the back of a stamp, such as from when they stick that swab up your nose to get the virus out. So this is a great thing because without this, our DNA or testing for the virus would not be possible. But there is a downside to this technology and that is called transfer DNA. So the whole idea of DNA is that Suppose I go commit a crime, I leave my DNA at the crime scene, and then I can be caught. But anyway, let me play this video. Oops. Let me play this video. And you can see the possible downside of this wonderful sensitive technique that we have. Here we go. You have seen how with the polymerase chain reaction or PCR, Forensic scientists can develop useful profiles from very small samples. But in practice, how small? 
In 1989, in Las Vegas, 14 year old Stephanie Isaacson was going to school but never got there. She was sexually assaulted and murdered while on her way. An attempt to identify her killer by DNA failed, as did a second attempt eight years later. With each attempt, some sample is used up, and so the remaining sample gets smaller and smaller. For a third attempt in 2021, using new techniques, only 120 picograms, or about 15 cells, remained. But this was enough to develop a profile of the killer, identified as Darren R. Marchand. He could not be brought to justice, however, because he'd committed suicide back in 1995. But this ability to use very small samples brings a problem with it, the problem of transfer DNA. How does this problem happen? Here, we have two friends, Jerry and Tom. Jerry doesn't know that his friendship with Tom will make him a suspect in a criminal case. One day, Jerry meets Tom. And they shake hands. But what happens when they do? We are continuously shedding our outer skin cells. So when they shake hands, some of Tom's skin cells will be transferred to Jerry's hand. And some of Jerry's skin cells will be transferred to Tom's hand. Just as Edmund Locard said, every contact leaves a trace. Now, Tom is a bad character and he needs money. So he robs a convenience store using a knife to threaten the cashier. But he panics <laughs> and as he runs out of the store, he drops the knife. The knife is important evidence because when Tom held the knife, skin cells containing DNA would have been transferred from his hand to the handle of the knife. But Jerry's skin cells were on Tom's hands. So that means Jerry's cells with Jerry's DNA will also be on the knife handle. Maybe only a very small amount, but we know that we only need a very small amount to develop a DNA profile. Now, let's assume we can get the two DNA profiles from the knife handle and we can distinguish between them. And let's also assume that Jerry has a criminal record so his DNA is in the database. But Tom doesn't, so his DNA is not in the database. So will Jerry go to jail? Well, he may be identified as a suspect, but there are other factors that we have to consider. Let us start with how many cells Jerry sheds. People shed different amounts Maybe Jerry is lucky, and he's one of those people who doesn't shed very much. And we have to think how long Jerry's cells will stay on Tom's hand, especially if Tom did something like wash his hands before he robbed that convenience store. Even so, with the ability of developing profiles from very small samples, Jerry may still be in the spotlight. However, we must look at the DNA evidence in the context of the totality of the evidence. There will be the second DNA profile, Tom's, even though it has yet to be matched to Tom. Then there's all the other possible evidence. For instance, are there CCTV cameras? Very likely in a convenience store. The cashier is a witness. Would the cashier pick out Jerry in a police lineup? <laughs> and does Jerry's phone place him in the vicinity of the convenience store at the time of the holdup? We have to take these possibilities and all the other possibilities of evidence into account as we investigate this case. So when we ask, 
whether Jerry will go to jail, we have to remember what Paul Kirk wrote. Physical evidence cannot be wrong. Only human failure can diminish its value. Okay, I hope you enjoyed that, uh, that little cartoon that was made by uh, our audio visual technical team here. I, I didn't do any of that animation. They did, a, they did that job for me. You have seen how. Okay, so let me give you an example, not a Tom and Jerry example, a real example. So back in 1975 in the North of England, there was a serial killer who targeted prostitutes and sometimes anyone he mistook for a prostitute. And this guy was nicknamed by the press as the Yorkshire Ripper. And serial killers are very hard to catch. And a few years later, after this guy had started, someone sent letters to the police claiming to be from the Yorkshire Ripper basically taunting the police, saying, you can't catch me. And the guy even sent a tape with these taunts on it. And the police thought these letters and the tape were genuine. Now, when they listened to the tape, the guy speaking had a very distinct accent. It's what we call a Geordie accent, and it's spoken by people from Newcastle. And it's a bit like that. It's a very difficult accent to understand, but it's very distinctive. So the police thought that the Yorkshire Ripper was from Newcastle. And that sent the investigation in the wrong direction because these letters on the tape were hoaxes. The Yorkshire Ripper was arrested in 1981 and he'd killed three more women in the meantime. And he was a man called Peter Sutcliffe, and he is not from Newcastle, and he does not have a Geordie accent. Then in 2005, those letters were reinvestigated. And remember, I said that with PCR, you can get DNA from the saliva of an envelope, the back of the stamp or where you seal the envelope. And that's what they did. They got that tiny amount of DNA from the envelope and they matched it to this man here called John Humble. He was nothing to do with the murders. He just didn't like the police. And he was given eight years in prison for perverting the course of justice. And if he had not sent that tape, maybe those three women would not have been murdered. So he's got a lot to answer for. So I mentioned databases. So many countries have databases. The UK database started in 1995. The Singapore database started in 2003. I believe India is now setting up its own database. And the way these databases work is that you, you get DNA from the crime scene and you compare it to your database of DNA and typically that database of DNA is DNA of known criminals. So if the person who committed that crime is a known criminal with his DNA in the database, you can identify him. And uh, the people who run the DNA database here tell me that they get about 40 criminals a month through the database. But, it only works if the person is already in the database. If the guy who committed the crime has no criminal record, he's not going to be in the database and you won't get him through this method. But that doesn't mean you won't get him. So this is a case from 1988. This woman called Lynette White was stabbed to death. Now, three men were convicted of the crime, but they were actually innocent and their conviction was quashed on appeal. 
So after those three were released, the police went back to reinvestigate the crime. And they went back to the crime scene, which was this room. And after the murder, the room had been redecorated. So they peeled back the layers of paint to the surface of 1988, and they were able to extract blood from them and get a DNA profile. But when they put that DNA profile into the national database, they didn't get a hit. Whoever committed this murder did not have a criminal record. But when they were looking at that DNA, they noticed some unusual features in the DNA. And when they searched the database just for those unusual features, they found 600 people. And just by looking at like age and gender and location, they could whittle that down to one person. Okay. And that person was a teenager with a motoring offense who hadn't even been born when the murder committed. But they picked out a feature in the DNA, not the whole DNA, it's not a match. What it means is that the real murderer is a relative of this teenager. And it turned out it was his uncle, a man called Jeffrey Gaffor. And he was convicted of the murder based on DNA, but he was found through this method. And this is called familial DNA. You don't find the criminal directly, but you find the criminal's family. So here's how familial DNA works. You get DNA from the crime scene and you search the database. And you don't look for an exact match, but you look for relatives. So you can identify a family group. You may get one hit from the database and that allows you to isolate this family group. You then investigate the family group and also the relatives of that family group, and that will give you the suspect. It's somebody in the family. Then you have to approach that person, get an authentic DNA sample, compare to the crime scene DNA. And if you've done it right, you've found your criminal. Now, let me say something about the databases. There are national databases, and there are also private databases, especially in the United States. There are private companies which have set up their own databases. And this is not for criminal purpose. This is so you can find your long lost relatives. Like suppose you know that you were adopted and you want to find your real mother. You send your DNA to these companies and they will go search, search, search. And if you're lucky, you find your birth mother. But anyone can submit their DNA to these databases, even police departments. And that's what happened in this case. The Golden State Killer was a serial killer in California. And for 12 years, he killed women. And then in 1986, he stopped. And he was never identified. But the police had DNA of him. And actually, the guy was a police officer. So his, he was never in the criminal database. But what the uh, police in California did was to send the DNA sample to one of these genealogy databases. And that's how they identified his family. And then by searching the family, they identified him. And so Joseph James D'Angelo was identified as the Golden State Killer, you know, 30 years after he stopped killing. But he was found through familial DNA using these private databases. And familial DNA, which started with the Jeffrey Kapoor case, is becoming a, a bigger and bigger technique uh, within 
criminal justice. So I think you can see why I said it's a DNA revolution. And I think, you know, from talking about familial DNA, you can see that it is a revolution that is continuing. So let me finish by telling you about Peter Falconio and Joanne Lees. And this is a case that happened in the northern part of Australia 20 years ago. So Peter and Joanne were from England and they traveled to Australia and they got themselves a van and they were driving around Australia just because it's a fun thing to do. And so they were crossing the Northern Territory, which is a very uh, unpopulated, sparsely populated state. And the driver of another vehicle got them to stop. And the driver of that other vehicle took Peter out of Joanne's sight and there was a gunshot. And from that moment, Joanne never saw Peter again. Then that other driver came back to Joanne, tied her hands, but she was able to escape and she went and hid in the bush. And eventually this guy drives away. So Joanne, when she felt safe, she came out onto the road, the truck driver picked her up and took her to the nearest police station. Now, the police came and they searched but Peter Falconio's body has never been found to this day. But they did find his bloodstains on the road. This guy, Bradley Murdoch, a known drug smuggler, was arrested on suspicion of committing the murder. And the question is, can Bradley Murdoch be linked to this murder? Well, they found a spot of his blood on her t-shirt. And when you do the DNA analysis, you calculate the statistics that it's his and not someone else. And that is the statistics. And that's a lot of zeros. You can see it's very convincingly his blood. They found his DNA on the gear stick of Peter and Joanne's camper van. And this is the strap that he used to tie Joanne's hands. They didn't get much DNA, but we have PCR, you don't need much DNA. And from the strap, they found the DNA of Joanne Lees. They found the DNA of Dr. Peter Thatcher, who was the DNA scientist doing the analysis and they found the DNA of Bradley Murdoch, and they calculated one in a hundred million that it's Bradley Murdoch and not someone else. So this was the evidence against Bradley Murdoch. No witnesses except Joanne Lees, but they've got the DNA. So there's the evidence. So if you don't have DNA from the blood spot, you would get blood type. And if it's a rare blood type, your odds are 30 to one. That's all. The gear stick of the camper van without DNA technology, you would not get any evidence because that DNA would just be from his skin cells of the gear stick. And from the strap, Again, without DNA technology, you wouldn't get any evidence of this trap. So you can see that without DNA, you would not be able to prove that Bradley Murdoch was the murderer and he would go free. So this is a quotation from uh, one of the lawyers in the case. One of these things by itself might not have been enough. Put together, you put all this DNA evidence together, there was a very damning case. And so I think the Peter Falconio murder is a very good demonstration of how DNA technology has revolutionized criminal justice.
So Bradley Murdoch was sentenced to a minimum of 28 years in prison. He's still there. Without DNA, he would have been a free man. So that's the case I used to conclude this lecture. As you can see, DNA has applications in terms of paternity and maternity. It's changed police work. The advent of DNA databases and familial DNA, familial DNA techniques has meant that criminals can be identified and then apprehended much more easily than in the past. So I hope you found that interesting. I hope you enjoyed my little cartoon and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Bates. It was an excellent talk. And uh, I would uh, now ask students if you have any questions you can ask. Certainly, yes. They're very quiet today. <laughs> yeah, not like last time. So anyone has any question you are? So a uh, very basic sort of question from my side. So the, there is one question. During the PCR process, how do the enzyme produces exact copy? it's because of the complementary base pairing. So, so where there's a T, the enzyme can only put an A. Where there's a G, the enzyme can only put a C. It's because, it's because of that complementary base pairing. If you try and take an A with a G, it just doesn't fit. And, and that, that is the basis of how how we replicate our DNA, as well as how it's done in the PCR machine. So, sir, like you mentioned, uh, the, if we look at the limitation of this DNA technology, specifically in the case of identical twins. So other than uh, the whole genome sequencing, and do we have any other technique which will tell us that, okay, these are you know, this is the person in case of identical twins. Well, I mean, one thing is fingerprinting because mm -hmm. identical twins do not have identical fingerprints. Yeah. Um, I mean, every case is different. You get cases where they just gave up because they couldn't tell the difference. Um, I saw one case from the United States where you had two identical twins, but one of them had a tooth missing. So when he smiled, you could tell which one it was. <laughs> so... Right, yeah, I saw that case from your side. It yeah. was like, yeah. And like, I think something related to smile also, something you mentioned in another case, oh. if I remember correctly. Yeah, uh, there's, there's many cases, but the, the only technique that you can say is general is the fingerprinting. And uh, when you, uh, another question, <laughs> this is like more because these students are learning about epigenetics as well. So I think one of the students is asking, can we use epigenetics for identification between twins? Well, I, I don't know much about epigenetics because I'm, I'm not a geneticist, but what I know they use epigenetics for is determining age. Um, age and also the marks which are present on the DNA. Um, so technically I think yes, but I don't know whether it has been used so far I don't for, for any identification of twins. What but, I understand is they use the whole sequencing. Okay. Um, but I was listening to a lecture by our uh, DNA people a few weeks ago and they can get age fairly accurately nowadays. Okay. So what they were talking about is what happens if your database gives you nothing? Okay. How much information can you get about the suspect from the DNA 
even though the database doesn't give you a hit. And age is one of the things they think they're quite good at. Then uh, there is another question, sir. What about the problem of DNA slippage during replication? That I can't comment on because, uh, as I say, that's not really my field. That's a bit too technical for me. So again, it's the it's the problem is out there because it's uh, enzyme is not perfect when it is copying, and that is why you are either seeing the expansion or it or the retardation. So that is very common among the individuals. So any other question? So uh, when we see these blood spots, like you mentioned. Uh, is it really uh, easy or is it difficult to get the DNA if we have the blood spot on someone's uh, cloth? I, th I think that's pretty standard now. Uh, so it, it has now become easier to yes. stack yes. the DNA, even if you are getting on the someone's cloth. Yes, like in the Bradley Murdoch case. Okay. Yes, the, prob the problem you have is that, that if you have blood of more than one person mixed up. Right. Like if there's a fight and there's blood everywhere, right. Right. Then, then it gets difficult because of course you're gonna get the DNA mixed up. And I was just wondering, like you mentioned in one of the case where you said, you know, that cartoon I really enjoyed where there was a mixing or transfer of DNA. Yes. <laughs> so, so then the, even if there is a transfer of DNA, the amount of the DNA will be very, very less in comparison. It will be the background. Like uh, uh, there, so there have been people who have, there are cases where uh, transfer DNA has been picked up. Um, I was reading a case a few weeks ago that there are people who have been charged based on transfer DNA. But don't they consider it as a mixing of DNA rather than, uh, or maybe it's just the chance that during that time that mixing, uh, because of the mixing, the another person's DNA got amplified. Yes, and and also you have the, um, so so when when the um, local DNA people were giving their lecture the other day, they've actually measured shedding of cells and some people shed almost nothing i mean some of the experiments they did they got no dna they got people to hold something and then they swapped it and some people shed nothing so you could have the criminal who's a very very low shedder and then it would be the criminal's dna that would be the minor component so I think, you know, if you have a combination of these circumstances, right, right. then that's when the problems start. But it was quite interesting because also people shed different amounts on different days. Yeah, so maybe there could be a research going on. <laughs> I mean, that's what, right. that's what that, that would be a good project to do. Is to I see, think so. I think compare so. your students. To, to right. Students. <laughs> just and, talking and, to you, I was just thinking that it could be a good uh, project sort of. Yeah, and, and also what, uh, what factors affect how much you shed on a given day. Right, right. Because they, they saw variability within the same person from day to day. It's quite right. interesting. It is, it is. So I think there are two, a uh, couple of questions. During familial DNA identification, how many generations later do the pattern stops getting matched? Like after three, four generations, is it really hard to show correlation? So that is the question. It's more about the how for how long we can trace the DNA. Yes, that's a very good question. Of course, at, at the moment we're only going to be dealing with two or three generations. So oh, we cannot predict uh, after that, like yeah. after four generations or so. Well, because because these databases are so new. We haven't gone that far yet. Like um, Joseph D'Angelo is what, 78 years old? So he's like uh, your grandfather's generation. There's three generations. This is more about the limitation we have yeah. in terms yeah. of getting the DNA, I guess. I mean, 
when it comes to longer time frames, then what people use is mitochondrial DNA. But that I took out because otherwise I'd be talking for too long. <laughs> yeah. yeah. If, if, you're, if you're familiar with the story of King Richard III of England, Yes, they are. They are. I actually no, discussed that. That's 500 years. So right. uh, for those long time frames, they use mitochondrial DNA. Uh, there are, is. Yes. Yes. Please go ahead. Please. So there's another question about distinguishing mixed DNA. Right. So you can distinguish mixed DNA if they're not in equal proportions. So if they're in equal proportions, meaning the peaks on the SDRs are about the same height, you can't distinguish. But if you have one major and one minor, then you can distinguish. Because you can pick out the big ones and the little ones and you know you've got two DNA profiles. So, so the answer is sometimes yes, sometimes no. Right. <laughs> so it's always, you know, we learn something whenever I hear your lecture. Last time we learned like uh, some of the people don't have any, uh, I think you told about the palm that they don't have any fingerprint. Oh, my, my niece, my niece who put her <laughs> finger in boiling water, yes. Yeah, this time, you know, about the shedding of DNA and how it is differentiated, the li limitations and everything. So thank you very much, sir. It was indeed a very um, exciting talk. Thanks a lot. Most welcome. You're most welcome. All right, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Hi. Yeah, it was a, a really uh, a great talk. I learned a lot. Basically, I'm not from a forensic biology background, but... Uh, I, I, I am uh, teaching this course uh, with the help of Nitumum and I, I learned a lot basically. Thank you so much. It, it, it gave me a good insight into the subject. You're, you're very welcome. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I, I hope next time I can actually be in Bhopal in person and not do it for Zoom. <laughs> of course, sir. We of course, will... yes. yes. Thanks a lot, sir. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Thank you.